Hello everyone, this is WebEx Software Saturdays. Unfortunately, because WebEx this week decided to not work and record it properly, I am re-recording this uh, the night after, so this might come out a little bit later, but this is the same lesson, more or less, as we covered during class. However, we are recording it uh, about a couple hours afterwards because WebEx would not let me record the actual live session. So you may not get to see some of the questions and answers, but everything else should be the exact same. So if you're watching along at home, as always, please fill out the attendance form. You can see on screen here. And as always, the slides we have are linked on Slack. So this is lesson five, Intermediate React JS. Uh, this is one of the last lessons we're going to cover this week, or this semester rather. And then, as you can see in our review of this semester, Intermediate React JS is the last of the five major topics. The next two weeks are going to be project days where you can come in, get help, work on your project, ask questions, whatever you need to do. And we'll go over all the project information in more detail later on. So uh, obviously the top one, the weekly learning sessions, not super applicable anymore because we have project days now, but if you want to come for help, as always, Saturdays at 3.30. And then we record, uh, we so hopefully not anymore, but uh, we record these sessions, except for this one, obviously, and post on the video every Sunday. And we also are hosting open review hours every Thursday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. I highly recommend you utilize these open review hours as it's a great way to get practice and just review the concepts you learn during class. And as always, every day, someone is always on Slack to answer any questions you guys have. So uh, if you're following along, you want to look at the examples, please look at VS Code or open whatever text editor you have installed. And then as always, the example files are on GitHub. Now, because this video is coming out a little bit later, let me, look, let me pull up to GitHub really quick. The master branch is the main branch you see when you first log in. Uh, the GitHub is actually going to be starter code for the final project. If you want to look at the code for the lesson five lesson, a little drop down menu here, choose lesson five branch. And that'll pull up all the final demo code for lesson five. Again, the master branch is going to have all of the project starter code, not the code for lesson five. So keep that in mind. And here we go. And uh, most people should already have this done, but please make sure you have installed Node.js and NPM. We use this all the time in React. You probably have used it before, so I'm not going to spend any more time on this. So let's just quickly go over some of the final information for Software Saturdays. So uh, like I mentioned way, way back when, if you complete our final project, you will receive a certificate from the Purdue College of Engineering. It's officially from them, not from us, since they sponsor our program. So this could look great on a resume, to a recruiter, on LinkedIn, wherever you may want to put it. We also have the advanced certificate if your project meets some additional requirements. Always advanced looks better on a resume, so if you feel like you want to go for it, please try to get the advanced certificate. So the next two weeks, like I mentioned earlier, are project days. So nothing new will be taught, but please come and work on your project, get questions answered, receive some help, whatever it may be. But these are a good opportunity to make sure that your project is uh, in the perfect spot to get this, either the intermediate or the advanced certificate. And project starter code and requirements will be sent out via an email probably on Monday. Uh, and the code is already on GitHub, like you see in the bottom here. The starter code is there, so you can use that code to basically uh, try working your project. And we'll go over all the requirements at the very end of class today. So, so a quick review of last week. Last week was basic React.js. We covered three major things, props, state, and on-click functions. So props are like parameters. They can change how a React component works. State is like a set of local variables where each component controls only its own state. State is not saved and state can influence how the React component works much more uh, frequently than props do. Props can only be modified once where state can be modified multiple times. And finally, if you want your React function to have it on a click, you must use the binding. You must bind this to the function because of a weird quirk in React. And you can go over that process as outlined last week. So we're going to go into the intermediate React.js. 
Well, we're only going to cover a few things, three major topics essentially, before launching into the de the final project. So it shouldn't be too much new material. So the first thing we're going to cover is the React component lifecycle. Each React component is loaded or unloaded at certain times. And using a set of predefined methods, we can run code only when a component moves through the lifecycle. So just like humans, you know, us humans, uh, live through, uh, like a, have a certain way going through life, a React component also has a certain way it goes through life. However, in the components case, it is oftentimes extremely important that only certain code is run at certain times, maybe for like uh, getting data, changing how the component works, logging information, closing up connections, whatever it may be, that only have to run at certain points during the component lifecycle. So you can use the uh, lifecycle method that we'll get out on the next slide to actually make sure the code is run properly. So the three major ones, there are a couple of more, but the three major ones are component did mount, component will unmount, and component did update. So component did mount is probably one of the most important ones that we're going to use actually today at the, towards the very end. And this function is called whenever the React component is first loaded. So this can be useful for like getting data maybe, or like uh, logging when the component first loads, whatever it may be. And component will unmount is called by the computer, I should add. It's not called by you, it's called by the computer when the React component is about to be removed. So again, this can be useful for like logging if something goes wrong, maybe closing some connections, saving some data, whatever you want it to do. It'll only do this when the component is about to be removed. And finally, component did update. This function is only called when the React component is finished changing. So this one is typically only used for logging information, like maybe you wanna save stuff about like who is online, like what data they're looking at, because this function is called quite a bit and can be quite hectic to work with. Again, the most important one is definitely the top one, component did mount. So the next topic I'm gonna to briefly go over is the JavaScript map function. So this JS map function creates another array by running a function on top of an array going through each element. It's kind of similar to a Lambda or list comprehension in Python if you've used that before. Uh, and it's really powerful because it allows us to create arrays that are based off of other arrays. So the syntax is really simple, just a map function, your input array, your what's called, I call it the iteration variable, but really it's more like the element we're currently working with, the function, and then the output array. So we can see here, let map output, here's our output array, here's our input array, and then here's a dot map function. What we're doing in this function here is we're taking every element in the little parentheses here element, and we're mapping it, or we this little arrow here, to this element times two which means that uh, every element is going to be doubled and then saved in a new array called map output. Now it's important to note here this little arrow symbol, with this, it is, is an equal sign and a, a greater, than or equal, greater than sign, it is kind of represents like an arrow, right? Showing how the element is being changed into something else as defined by this right here. This little, I call it a function, but this little statement right here. And you're going to see that this is a very powerful command. So let's look at demo really quick. So I have VS Code open. Uh, the first demo we're actually going to look at is this HTML demo. So this is one of the, this is the if we haven't we haven't seen HTML in quite a while, but this is a plain old HTML demo that you know, has a, here's a basic HTML page. And if you look at the JS the JavaScript file, it's literally just going to be a array input array mapping it using two different methods, and then logging the outputs. So we have this array here, numbers one, two, three, four, and five. And then we have two outputs, map output one and map output two. So map output one is a result of mapping each element of the numbers array. So again, here's the output, the input, the map, and then here is the element we're kind of working with. And we're mapping it using this little arrow here to this, as we have the slides, element star two. So this again is almost the exact same as we had in this slide to show you how you can double each element of array, assuming the element is a number. The second one's a little bit more complicated. Uh, essentially, instead of having a single line like we had before, we actually are passing in a whole function. So again, in JavaScript, functions are defined by curly braces, which is defined as a little block right here, it's a curly, it's all curly braces, actually. 
all the way there, all the way down there. And this function is actually a very basic if statement. So it'll take each element and apply the function defined by these curly braces to it. The function here is if the element, which is again defined from each element of the number array, is mod 2 equal equal 1. So mod 2 equal equal 1 is actually a programming trick that's very common if you ever programmed before, but it's a way to tell if a number is even or odd. Remember, modulus uh, gives us the remainder of a number, uh, the remainder of this number when divided by the one on the right. So if any number divided by 2 gives you a remainder, it cannot be even, since numbers that are even are inherently divisible by 2. So since the remainder is 1, it has to be odd. So what we're basically saying is if the number is odd, return the element, so store the element back in the map output 1. If it's even though, store the number 0. So what will happen is our array will go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to 1, 0, 3, 0, 5, because 2 and 4 are both even. And so if we open up our PowerPoint here and look at the console output, so again, it's F12 in Firefox, or right-click and inspect element, and go to our console, you'll see the top is our array, the bottom is our doubling array, which indeed is the doubling element, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And the bottom is actually the uh, weird little even odd thing we did. Again, 1, 0, 3, 0, 5. Exactly like we did last week. Or in this, in the code, my bad, not last week. So that was the basics of demo 1. Now, the other demo 1 you have here is, you can see here in my app.js file, I have a demo 1 program set up. And if we go to 2 demo 1, you will notice that this was uh, testing out the different methods available to us for the component lifecycle. So we, we initialize a state with a step of 1, just to show what step process we're on in the, uh, the lifecycle process. And for each of these three major methods, we say if it did mount, we, uh, if, it, if it mounts, we say we have mounted, we step number whatever, increment the step. If we update, we uh, inc we print it out and we increment the step. And if we unmount, same thing. And if you render out, we just render out the p tag saying, oh, here's some rendering and this is step number whatever. Now, please note, see these two lines. Please never, ever, ever set the state from component did update. What will happen is your code will break. It'll, it'll create a code called an endless update stack because what's gonna happen is the component will update so it'll change the state, so it'll update the component, and then change the state, and then update the component, and then change the state, over and over and over again until the React code crashes. So never, ever, ever set state from, an update, from a, a component did update function. That's why I said component did update is typically only used for logging or basic storing of information, not for anything super important. So if we go to our uh, code again on here, we look at here, we can open up our console again, and we can see that the component uh, mounting is step one, the component updating is step two, and then the component rendering is step three. Now, it's important to note that there is no step four here, which is the unmounting, because this, comp this, uh, this component never disappears. But if we were to remove it, maybe having a button that removed it, you would see a step four saying this component is about to unmount. So that is demo number one. Now this is a, little, a shorter one, a little short little side note to add on to the map topic, but you can actually use the map function to create a list of JSX elements to display uh, to the actual screen. And you will definitely see why we want to know this in a few slides when it comes to much more relevant. So before we go into the demo two, let me just quickly explain this again. Instead of your function changing the element, your function can just give return in you know in the, uh, the in the proper language here a JSX element, and that can basically display to the screen as a giant list. So demo two is all about that. It's a pretty short you know it's a little side note here. Demo two, let me just hide demo one for you guys. Uh, here we go, and let's unhide demo two. Perfect. So demo two, we pass in props. Again, props are passed in right here. Numbers, and it's passing in an array. One, two, three, four. Actually, I'm gonna delete these ones just for a later point. 
Please note that unlike last week, this array has to be wrapped around curly braces because again, props are JavaScript and we have to, and to pass in JavaScript, we have to use curly braces in JSX. If you want to do anything that isn't a string, we essentially have to use curly braces around the thing you want to pass in. Let's go to demo two. Here we go. And demo two is it's a very basic code here. It's a list of numbers, which is essentially the numbers, this.props.numbers, and we map each number inside of numbers. Again, mapping is we're changing something to an LI. LI, we didn't necessarily go over that week one of HTML, but it stands for a list item. It's basically used for unordered bullet point lists. So we're saying that each list item will just be the number which is passed in via props. So we can see the props were one, two, three, four, five. So what we do is we then render the UL stands for unordered list, a unordered list of list items, which in this case is number. So we should see a bullet point list of one, two, three, four, five. And if we go to our code, that is actually exactly what we see. One, two, three, four, five. And so we can actually even update this, make it a bit fancier. We can even say six, seven, eight, I don't know. And if we go to our code here, it actually now shows the one through five as well as six, seven, eight. So you can see how mapping is super important because we turn this single string of, you know, characters, so moves to the spacing to make it more consistent for everybody. We see this very simple array is actually creates a bunch of elements of JSX. So in, a sense, in essence, it makes it much easier to write code where the data size may be large or variable. Cool. So that's time for checkpoints. Now, obviously, we're not going to spend too much time doing checkpoints since, you know, it's a recording. But if you want to follow along, pause the video here. Your checkpoint is to try to make a map for React components. Almost basically the exact same way we did mapping in demo number two. If you want to choose different JSX elements, you can also choose, for example, a div instead of a UL tag and a P tag instead of a uh, LI tag. But let's basically try writing the code from scratch to give it a set of input data, map that input data to a bunch of JSX elements. Okay, I hope everyone had a chance to work on that checkpoint. Again, pause it if you want to spend some more time. But we're going to move on to the next little topic here. The next topic is called APIs. So APIs are used a lot. They stand for Application Programming Interface, and they are used to send data to or from our code and another server. They're used everywhere on the web. Everything is an API somewhere, from your Amazon shopping cart, to your Instagram feed, to your Brightspace login, to you name it. There's guaranteed an API somewhere transferring data from, again, from someone's code to some other server on the web. So they're obviously extremely useful and they're actually important for our final project. So web-based APIs have standardized on using what's called JSON or JavaScript object notation to send data using key value pairs. So we briefly went over JSON or JavaScript objects in week two during our JavaScript lecture. So review those slides if you want some more practice. But basically what's gonna happen is JSON, where we'll give it, it will get JSON back from the API and we can call key, we can give it a key to receive data. Now these keys can be whatever they want. We'll get an example of them in a little bit. And that data can be whatever data that key references. So the API that we use is called pokeapi.co. Uh, if you click on the link here, it'll pull it up. Now, the major thing to look at here for is this giant box, this try it now box. And this is gonna walk you through the important parts of the API. So this API is full of Pokemon data from quite literally every Pokemon game and every Pokemon uh, creature in the entire you know, franchise. So this first half of the URL here is the same, but the second half is what we tell the API to receive data of a certain type. So the data we're here is about the Pokemon called Ditto, which is, you know, if you're familiar with Pokemon, it's a pretty big Pokemon. And here we have a bunch of data, 
given back about Ditto in the JSON format. So you can, actually, you can click this little button to view the raw JSON if you want to do that, or we can view the nice, the nice little more interactive viewer for us humans. So for example, the, 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 the API gives us the abilities, its forms, experience, height, games, what items it can hold, its moves, where you can find it, with species, sprites, type, state, everything. More than you could ever want about a certain Pokemon. And there's actually even more you can do too. If you know what the ID is, you, look, you can look it up by ID. So for example, the ID of Ditto is 132. But if you want to say ID number one, which is, I believe, Bulbasaur, you can find out data about Bulbasaur. Also, you can look at my types, abilities, a whole bunch of things. But the one that I'm going to focus on here that's super important for both the demo and for our final project is this final little try it now right here. This is going to be more of a general search that is saying, not give me data about a single Pokemon, give me a list of Pokemon. So Pokemon question mark limit equals something and offset equals something. So everything after this question mark is what's called a get request. And it's basically saying, here are some options for my API request. So in this API request, I want you to get me 100 Pokemon. This, whoop, my bad. This limit equals 100. Starting with Pokemon, excuse me, starting with Pokemon number 201. So offset 200 means ignore the first 200 and only begin, give me poke, only begin giving me Pokemon from the 100, the 200th Pokemon. So you can see the result is the count, obviously. Then some other, you know, we don't care about these other three. R, what we care about is this bottom one, results. So results is going to literally be an array of 100 items and each item is going to have a name and a URL the name of the Pokemon and the URL for more data about that Pokemon. So you can see 201 and all the way at the bottom is 300. So you, you, I would be thinking if I were you, huh, I have an array and I have a bunch of data. I can map the elements of this array into a React element if I wanted to. And that's exactly the rewrite. So if you pull up our, whoopsie daisy, I have too many things open right now. Data from your API can be mapped into a React component because it's an array. Essentially, it's an array in a fancier way. This allows us to create a user interface that will change depending on the data we receive. And that is why React is so powerful because it can completely change how it looks or even change how much of it you, know, you have on screen depending on what kind and how much data you get from an API. On Slack, there are actually a couple examples by one of our mentors of other APIs, including Spotify, that you can look at if you want some more practice with the APIs in React, as well as a list of I think almost 100 nearly, I could be wrong about that, other public APIs you can play around with uh, for different kinds like sports, video games, arts, movies, TV shows, science, you name it, there's a whole bunch. So if you want some more practice, look at the Slack in the fall 2020 web dev channel. So time to demo three. So as always, we're going to quickly just uh, comment out demo two and uncomment demo three here. And demo three is going to be a little more complicated. So we're going to take some time and walk through this code. So this top part looks pretty familiar. What we're doing here is we're just binding the uh, get API function I have written here with the word this because we use some set state stuff. So we always have to do that. Don't forget. And then we have some state where the Pokemon is an array, a blank array at the current moment. So we're gonna we're gonna ignore this function right now, and we're gonna come down to this function here first. Surrender. So we have some JSX. This JSX is a bunch of unordered lists. So again, you all is like a bullet point essentially. And we're going to render a bunch of list elements stored in the state.pokemon. Again, it's currently a blank array. So when you first load the page, it'll actually be a bunch of blank lines. But we're okay with that. What we then have here is this one right here, component did mount. This is, again, this is extremely why that function is so important. You only, only, only want to load your API once your component mounts. 
If you do not, if you put it, for example, the render method, so you put this call to the API the data command, uh, function in your render function, what will happen is your web browser will, will seize up as it essentially tries to make hundreds upon hundreds of requests to this API. So your, your browser will basically you know, become super laggy, might become unresponsive, and might even crash. So make sure you only call your data once and you only call it once the data first, when the data needs to be, uh, need, when the data needs to be used, not even not before that, not after that. The safest place to put this is then component did mount. So in this function here, so you might notice this async keyword before this function. Async just means that this function will run in the background of everything else to make sure that the rest of your code can actually run uh, like load the page, for example, and not wait for your function to finish. This is especially good if you're on a, a slow network connection so that your page won't basically freeze until the data finishes because it could take a while for the data to load properly. Now, these first three lines, we will always give you in every starter code we use for both Lesson 5 and for the final project because we do not expect you to know the intricacies of API calling. But the basics are, we have the URL. So again, this URL is getting 10 Pokemon with limit equals 10, starting with the zero with Pokemon. And then gets the, gets the data from the URL and turns it into a JSON object we can use everywhere else. This bottom bit looks to look pretty familiar. What it does is it takes the response of the submit response in the JSON format and again, remember, that's a JSON object where one of the keys is results, and results is an array. So we take that array, and because it's an array, we can use map. So we map each item of the array, we change it into a list element to be used in our bullet point list down here. Now this list element is going to have item.name, colon, find more at, than the URL. Because remember, that array was full of JSON objects that stored the name and the URL of each Pokemon. We then set the, set the state, so we say Pokemon equals response Pokemon, just like this, so that when the data finishes loading, it'll be properly shown to the user. So if you open up our web browser here to see how our code works, ta-da, we have a list of 10 Pokemon from all the way from Bulbasaur to Caterpie, with their name, colon, find more at, and then the URL where you can find more data about that Pokemon. And that is why this is such a powerful command. Because we can change those values to you whatever way we want. Like for example, maybe we want 20 Pokemon, starting with the 15th Pokemon. Whatever you want, it's not super important. But the React code will handle it, no matter what you give it. We can make it, for example, 15 if you wanted to, even 30, and it wouldn't care because it would just map it properly because map does not care how much or how little data you have. So that is why we use map and why React is, again, so powerful. So I hope that was a bit informative about some of the more advanced parts of React that you can definitely use in your, uh, the intermediate parts of React that you can use in your final project. So as uh, if, you, if you aren't 100% aware, the final project is going to be a Pokedex style application using the Poke API, where you have to show us some kind of Pokemon, like their names, their heights, their weights, their XP, their games, whatever you want to show, up to you. But you have to fulfill a few requirements. So again, there are two kinds of certificates, intermediate and advanced. So we'll go through the requirements right now for both of them. The intermediate React com uh, certificate, you must have the following. At least two components. These two components cannot be app.js or index.js. At least one component has to have state. And at least one component has to have props. And finally, you have to use at least one API call in your code. You might want to make two, but you have to have at least one. But I think for some of the other requirements, you might need to use two. Now, to also get the certificate, you also have to use choose two of these three options. The two are including some CSS with your components, adding a user interactive element like a button or a div. Remember, any HTML tag can have an on-click function, or loading images of each Pokemon. Now, I think two of these, I think they're all pretty easy, but I think two of these are probably slightly easier than the other ones, but I think all three 
everyone here can probably do those. So I'm not worried about this at all. But if you're feeling a bit more advanced, we are also offering the advanced certificate. So the requirements for the advanced certificate are the same must-haves as the intermediate certificate, but instead of only choosing two, you have to now do all three of the other options as well. So there are seven total must-have requirements, meaning you must have the CSS and the user interactive element and the images of each Pokemon. To also get the advanced certificate, you have to choose one of these four. You have to either navigate to a second page with more info about each Pokemon, you have to add a search bar, add the ability to download a file with Pokemon stats, or use the Material UI React.js library. So we haven't actually covered any of these four things during class. This is mostly going to be a testament to your ability as a programmer, as a student, to learn this for yourself. That's kind of why we kept it as the advanced material, so that if you're feeling confident and want to learn more about React, you know where to get help and get resources to get the final project. And as always, if you want some more help with this, we will walk you through all of these four things by, by you know, step by step. We won't do them for you, we won't give you code, but we will tell you where to look, the, how to begin working with this, stuff like that. So if you want to go for the advanced one, the mentors and I are a great resource to begin looking at. So before we jump into the checkpoint, I want to just go over some of the more final project stuff. I think I have it in here. So here's the document I'll send out. This is not it, by the way. This is the wrong document. Whoopsie daisy. I will send out a document, again, the server code is on GitHub, uh, with all this information for everybody about the final project. But essentially, the final project, if it wants to load for me really quick, is going to be like this. So we give a quick, a quick little uh, blurb about the project and the certificate program. All projects have to be given to us by November 7th. This is so we have enough time before finals and all of you know before everyone has to start studying for exams to grade and deliver the certificates for everybody. If you do need more time though, please email us for help. We will most likely give you an extension if you have a good, if you have a good reason. We have online work days on the 24th and the 30th of 31st of October. So please stop by if you want some help with that. And as always, you can get ideas or ask questions on Slack in the, in the fall 2020 web dev channel. To submit your project, just you know, follow the instructions here, zip all the important files that we're gonna to need to create your project and email it to me. And you can also view a, a working example of the project on GitHub. I have here a link to my personal GitHub, but I have it hosted. Please note though, this, this is an optimized source code build, so you cannot view any of the original React components. So again, I also have on this document all of the other, all of the requirements you're going to need, and I'll email this out with some more info about it probably on Monday. So again, here's the final code for the uh, final project. In the Pokedex app, I have the SRC folder like we always do. And uh, in the component folder, we give you two base files, the component template like we do every time and the API component, the API template. This is going to be the API code that you're going to want. You may want to modify uh, these couple lines here, maybe you want them exactly the way you have them set up, but you will need for a fact these top lines, almost guaranteed. So wherever you see the word modify, please make sure you delete the comments of this whole entire thing and replace it with whatever you need for your code to function properly. Now it's time for a quick demo of the final project. Actually, I put my URL in wrong, haha. -ha. So again, my, it's hadiamud098 at .github.io slash pokedex. And you can see here a working example of the advanced certificate project. Actually, actually, this project here you see will actually meet, if you were to code it yourself, all of the advanced certificate requirements. So it just has a little title here, a little bit, a little bit about the project, and a link to our website, plug, plug, plug. And each Pokemon card, which gives you the name, a little picture of the Pokemon, the height, the weight, and the base experience of each Pokemon. There's also a little load more button to load more Pokemon. So it defaults to 10. We can load in 10 more every single time. 
until your heart, you know, has seen enough Pokemon. At the very bottom, the very small little search box. So you can type in a search, like maybe say I'm gonna look up the word Piplup. Hit a little search, and they'll pull up the code, the co the Poke card I call it for Piplup. So it's you know it's name, height, weight, and experience. And if you look up a Pokemon that doesn't exist, like say test, it'll give you no f not found to show you that there was an error in the processing. So again, this is always publicly available. So if you want to make, if you want to look at what a final bunch look like, uh, please look at our website. Look at my website. But again, not every feature you see here has to be implemented to receive the intermediate certificate. If you only want the intermediate one, you can actually ignore these pictures if you wanted to, the entire bottom search box, this load more button, whatever you wanted. You know, as long as your product meets the requirements I put in the document. So as a final little wrap up, the checkpoint for the little last little bit of class today was to try to write some code to download data from the API similar to Demo3. So you can either use the code we gave you for Demo3 or practice with the code we gave you for the final project. But do remember that the code you write here, you will probably end up using for your final project. So it's in your best interest to actually uh, write some code that's pretty useful for you. And as always, thank you for listening to this video. I hope I was uh, hope it was okay. I know it's pretty bizarre, you know, without the uh, chat and the next to it. But please give us some feedback at our forum here. We do ask, especially because this is our last session, that you re you fill out the feedback form. It takes about five seconds to fill out. It's completely anonymous, and we do use this to help us practice what we or fix what we can do better for next semester and what we can improve upon and keep doing for next learning units. Also, if you have any feedback about what we should do next time, also put it in the feedback form. We'd love, that. We'd love to hear it. And if you have any questions, uh, that not exactly applies to you, but Slack is always there. And then open review hours every Thursday. The link to that is always posted on Slack as well. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope this is an informative video about the final project and about the React.js advanced, the intermediate React.js stuff. If you have any questions, again, please look at this, you know, this slide on the screen here. Otherwise, thank you for listening. I hope everyone here has a great day. And please, if you have any questions at all, ask us on Slack or come to help hours. Bye.